Hello and welcome to our AVI Global Trust presentation. At this time of year, we would be normally welcoming shareholders in person to our annual general meeting in London. But as in so many ways, our lives are far from normal and we're taking a very different virtual approach to this year's AGM. Whilst we cannot meet in person, I would like to reassure you that all those involved in your company have been working well and we're pleased to say that we have encountered no operating difficulties at all. As I said in the annual report, if shareholders do have any questions about our report or indeed the upcoming presentation by Joe, please do send us an email or a letter. We'll publish all replies to your questions on our website and reply to all the letters. I'd now like to hand over to Joe to talk to you about the portfolio, to highlight some of the holdings and to update you on what the team has been up to. Most importantly, on behalf of the board, I hope you and your families are well and we all may enjoy some time together over the Christmas holidays. And also very, very much hope to see you all in person next year. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for that introduction and welcome to you, our shareholders, for joining us at this rather different AGM presentation for AVI Global Trust. Before I start my talk, I'd like to draw your attention to the important disclaimer, which I'd ask you to note. Thank you. Over the years, I have looked forward to seeing the familiar faces at the AGM each year, and I do hope we will be able to meet face to face again next year. I don't need to tell you just what a challenging year 2020 has been. In terms of investment performance, the financial year can be split into three parts. The first, from the end of September 2019 until the end of January 2020, went smoothly. Markets continued their upward trajectory and all seemed well. When the coronavirus pandemic hit us at the end of January and sent markets reeling, we really felt that in terms of our performance. In addition to falling net asset values, we suffered from widening discounts. And you can see that on the graph in the yellow beige color here. The weighted average discount on our portfolio hit 46%, an unprecedented level and far beyond the levels we experienced during the financial crisis and the Euro crisis. The 40% level has never previously been breached. At our halfway stage at the end of March, we were down 24.7% year to date, more than 7% behind the MSCI World XUS Index. We do expect discounts to widen materially during times of panic, but we also expect them to bounce back to more normal levels when markets set down, settle down. And this was indeed the case from the end of March onwards. As markets rebounded, discounts started to narrow, and at the end of September, they stood at 34%. This is still very wide in absolute terms and relative to historical ranges, but it is clearly narrower than 46%. And this tightening of discounts provided a tailwind to our performance and contributed partially to the very strong performance we experienced during the second half of the year. We outpaced the broader market by over 14%. And this meant that for the full year, although we were flat in NAV terms, we did outperform by almost 2%. I said a moment ago that the tightening of discounts contributed partially to the strong recovery in performance. And I use the word partially because there are two other important contributing factors to this. The first is that as markets were reaching new highs in December and January, we had been raising cash in the portfolio by selling down some assets and reducing gearing. Shareholders will be aware that in recent years, we've taken advantage of rather low interest rates on long-term debt. And more recently, we've taken out shorter-term facilities at very attractive rates. Whilst we were uncomfortable making big market timing calls, we do actively adjust the gearing employed from time to time to reflect the opportunities we are finding. We wanted to have some cash available were there to be any volatility and felt uncomfortable being fully geared at that time. And this meant that as markets started falling in February, we did have cash available to deploy and putting money to work at lower prices 
boosted our returns over the second half. The second and more important factor was the change in tilt within the portfolio away from cyclical and economically exposed companies to companies we felt were better placed to deliver profit growth at a time when economies around the world were being forced into lockdowns. The companies we sold appeared to be cheap on valuation grounds. They were trading on wide discounts, but on the whole, they looked to be vulnerable to the effects of lockdown. In contrast, the companies on the right-hand side had exposures to e-commerce, to health technology, to gaming and entertainment, and given the sell-off in markets, were available at valuations that really were quite attractive. They were also liquid, and this meant that we could get in quickly, but that if we were wrong, we had the flexibility to move out quickly too. Overall, the tilt towards more growth companies boosted our returns dramatically over the period, as they performed extremely strongly, and in most cases have now reached new highs. In contrast, much of what we sold, whilst having recovered somewhat from the lows of March, remain well below previous highs. I would emphasize that although the exposure to companies with so-called growth and quality characteristics has gone up within the portfolio, we have not sacrificed our focus on discounts. Each of these companies was bought on remarkably wide discounts. Companies like Kinovic, Process and KKR were acquired on discounts of almost 40%. And in the case of SoftBank, at discounts at times exceeding 70%. This is another reminder that during times of panic, equity markets can become extremely inefficient. And whilst it is difficult to put money to work when markets are crashing and the world is having to deal and adjust to a global pandemic, experience tells us that markets do overreact on the downside and our job is to try and exploit that. I think this slide is hugely important, probably the most important slide in terms of understanding our approach to investing. We talk a lot about the different types of company we invest in, family controlled holding companies, closed end funds, Japanese special situations. But in reality, the key driver of our own returns will be the businesses that those companies we own directly will in turn actually own themselves. If they do well, the NAV of our portfolio will go up and AGT's NAV in turn will go up. With all the changes we have made to the portfolio this year, and indeed in the last couple of years too, the best way of thinking about what AVI Global Trust is, is to break our portfolio down into a number of different themes and to look at the actual businesses we ultimately own and the factors that will determine how much they grow in value. One of the things that is often not appreciated is that our objective is to own great companies, but to access them through structures that allow us to own them at discounts to their true value. We do not want to own companies that are cheap for a reason. We want companies that are gonna go up in value and by accessing them through entities that are overlooked by other investors, we can boost our returns as discounts narrow. Key themes within AGT currently are digitally enabled growth and quality category leaders. In many cases, these remarkable businesses have cemented their market leading positions during the lockdown environment. Companies like Babylon and Livongo, which may be less familiar, are businesses exposed to health and medical technology, an area we think will see tremendous growth in years to come. At the same time, however, we retain an important balance in the portfolio. The tilt towards more growth names has helped tremendously this year, but we retain exposure to what we believe are great businesses that are facing and have faced during, during this year, understandably tough headwinds and challenges. Companies such as Hilton and Mandarin Oriental, hotel businesses have clearly had a tough year, but they are strong companies and have valuable brands and they will recover as global economic activity continues to pick up. Our exposure to Japan, to Japan is built upon the idea of improving corporate governance and shareholder activism. Many of the companies we invest in 
are exposed to the global economic cycle and saw sharp falls in sales and profits this year. These two are financially resilient. Our companies have over half of their market caps in surplus net cash. And in addition to that, many have listed securities on their balance sheet that boost the liquid asset cover to market cap ratio to over 90%. Whilst earnings in, in Japan declined in the first half of the year, since the summer, they've experienced a V-shaped recovery and are on track to get back to last year's profit levels. In terms of share prices, these companies have already started to recover. And as a group, the Japanese companies and those exposed to cyclical recovery provide an important balance to the AVI Global Trust portfolio. This slide shows in a little bit more detail the extent of the changes we have made over the course of the year, as well as the extent that some of the companies I've highlighted make up of our look through portfolio. It also shows you which holding company or listed structure we are investing in through which you get the exposure to the particular underlying business. In terms of contributors, you see here the impact that many of the new names have made to the performance over the course of the last 12 months. In addition, several of the longer standing investments, such as Pershing Square Holdings, Investor, Fondor, and the Japanese names, have also made strong contributions to, the, to performance. You can also see that we locked in losses at some of the companies we sold, like Riverstone and Wendell, and on the partial sale of Jardine as well. But these losses have been far outweighed by the positive performance of the names that replaced them. I'd like to elaborate on a few specific examples of companies we have invested in this year, which I think will provide some interesting insight into our thinking and process and positioning of the portfolio. The first company I'd like to talk about is the listed Swedish investment holding company, Kinevik. We have long been fans of their success in investing in more growth focused areas of the economy, whilst at the same time, balancing that by investing in more mature cash flow generating businesses. Prior to the lockdown sell-off, we had a stake in Kinevik, but we boosted it substantially in April 2020. The key attractions of Kinevik at the time were the exposure to the leading European e-commerce retailer Zalando and the exposure to the health tech company in the US, Livongo. We felt these companies were likely to prosper during lockdown and wanted to have more exposure to these businesses. Given the sell-off in markets, not only were the share prices of Kinevik, Zalando and Livongo depressed, but the discount at which Kinevik traded at had ballooned out to 37%. And as you see on the graph, this was unprecedented. Since then, the investment has been tremendously successful. The share price of Kinevik has doubled. The discount has now in fact turned into a premium. And as a consequence, Kinevik has been our largest contributor to returns this year. Indeed, in the last few weeks, we've actually been reducing our exposure to Kinevik and have been selling uh, part of our holding at a premium of around six to 7%. The next company I'd like to um, highlight to you is a Euronex listed investment company called Process. And the story with Process is very simple that it holds stakes in a number of uh, e-commerce and internet related businesses, but its key asset is a 30% stake in the Chinese internet company, Tencent. And that stake in Tencent makes up 85% of the overall NAV in process. Like Kinovic, process sold off as the market sold off in, Mar in February and March. And like in the case of Zalando, Tencent, the, look -through, the key look-through holding in process, had, had declined in value and was available to, uh, to invest at valuation levels that were previously unseen. And in addition to that, process, which typically had traded at a discount of around 25%, saw its discount balloon out to around 40%. 
So we were able to buy into Tencent at more attractive valuation levels and access that through process on a wider than normal discount. Since that time, Tencent has recovered strongly and has driven the share price and NAV of process upwards. The discount on process has narrowed a little, but remains wide. But encouragingly, management of process announced a couple of weeks ago that they were embarking on a share buyback program of up to $5 billion in order to take advantage of the wide discount and try and force that discount to come down and to, and to narrow, all of which we wholeheartedly support and will be a positive boost to our own performance. Christine Dior is a French listed holding company and is controlled by Bernard Arnault and his family. They hold a stake in Christine Dior of over 97%. And the sole asset within Christine Dior is the controlling interest in LVMH, the luxury, luxury goods business. Like the previous examples, LVMH suffered in terms of share price performance and also in terms of its operating business as the world went into lockdown and as consumers were unable to go shopping for luxury goods. This meant that LVMH was trading at more attractive levels than it had been trading at in previous years, as we were confident that as we would come out of lockdown as, and as economic activity would resume, LVMH would be a beneficiary of that renewed spending. In addition, like the other examples, Christian Dior, which typically had traded at around NAV, was now available to buy at a discount of wider than 25%. So again, we were able to access a high quality business in LVMH at a previously unavailable discount. We are confident and have already seen signs of a strong pickup in sales at LVMH that is driving the share price forward. And in addition, we are sure that at some point, the family will consolidate uh, the holding in Christian Dior by privatizing it, and we will be able to exit at, uh, at or very, very close to NAV. I'd like to end with an example uh, from the Japanese uh, part of the portfolio, and that is Fujitech. Fujitech is one of the top 10 global elevator businesses and uh, is a very attractive business, generates very stable earnings from the maintenance and upgrade contracts that it has in place, having installed elevators and escalators. And it is this attractions, attractive characteristics of the business that have led to a lot of corporate activity within the global elevator industry during the course of this year. Fujitech trades at a material discount to the valuations we see elsewhere. And as part of our shareholder activist approach in Japan, we published in April a 75 page note highlighting to the market and to other investors just how cheap Fujitech was and the action that we felt ought to be taken by management to remedy that, that valuation. It covered balance sheet efficiency issues, too much cash on the balance sheet. It covered corporate governance issues, and it covered a number of different operating and strategic initiatives that we felt the company ought to pursue in order to narrow the gap at which it traded relative to those global peers. By highlighting to other investors, just how cheap the company was and, and by putting pressure on management to take action to remedy that, the market has become much more aware of just how cheap Fujitech is. And since that time, Fujitech's share price has outperformed the broader Japanese market by around 40%. Again, highlighting how shareholder activism can be effective in Japan and again, how cheap uh, many of the situations that we are investing in Japan are. I hope that these examples have given you a flavour for what we've been doing in recent months and for how the portfolio is currently positioned. And a full list of our holdings as at the 30th of September is shown here. As I've said earlier, we own some fantastic businesses, but unlike other managers, 
We own them through entities that are trading at very wide discounts. Discounts that don't always make sense. We will continue to proactively manage the portfolio and take advantage of some of the inefficiencies that arise from time to time, particularly when it comes to exploiting discounts that other investors overlook. Our detailed proprietary research process, process focuses on identifying businesses that we, we believe will grow in value over time. I thank you for listening to me. And whilst we can't answer questions at the usual presentation, we do want to hear your questions. So please email them to agm at aviglobal.co.uk and we'll do our best to provide answers on our website in due course. Thank you again for joining me and I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible in person next year. Thank you.